here. So I'm going to welcome you officially to uh, Beginning Mountain Dulcimer. We've got 29 people here. That is awesome. Uh, if you're in this workshop and you're not necessarily a novice beginner, um, there will be some fundamentals here and uh, some things that are always nice to look back at. Uh, but this is really for beginner players and novice players. And so we will uh, be starting somewhere just north of string side up and continuing on from there. So this is page one of uh, the handouts for Beginning Mountain Dulcimer. And um, there are a couple of different names for some of these things. So when they come up, I'll, I'll mention it. But this is the anatomy of the Mountain Dulcimer right here. So we're talking about different parts of it. You know what people are referring to. Uh, at the very, very top of the instrument, and this is kind of funny, we talk about the top of the instrument as being the head, the headstock, and we talk about the bottom of the instrument being the tail. But also the bottom of the instrument is where the highest notes are, and the top of the instrument is where the lowest notes are. That can be confusing. But nonetheless, if you stand this instrument upright, uh, the headstock is the very, very top thing here. Now I'm seeing something flashing. I want to make sure that I haven't lost audio. Uh, Jay, can you still hear me? Just looking over at you. I got a little notice over there. The headstock's the very top of the instrument. You might have a scroll head like the one that's pictured, or you might have a flat head. And you really can't see my insert there, but you probably have a flat head or a headstock. That's a scroll head. Inside that um, piece at the top of the instrument are the tuners. Sometimes they're called tuning gears. And this is what enables us to, to either stretch the string or relax the tension on the strings by turning them. The string wraps around the edge. And we use that to actually tune the strings up to the correct pitch so that we can play. I'm going to zoom in here a little bit more. And right there, at the very end of the fretboard, you're going to see either a little white piece, a little black piece, or it may be made of wood. It might even be gray in color. And that's called the nut. It's a kind of a funny name. I'm not even sure where they came up with that, but it's the nut. And it's got some slots cut into it. And that's where the strings feed through on their way to connect to the tuning gears or tuners at the very, very top. That's the nut. It's very important. We'll be coming back to that in just a little bit. Of course, running down the length of the dulcimer, we've got strings. Some of you have got a double melody string, and some of you have opted to go with a single melody string. So sometimes I'll refer to that melody string, uh, I'll refer to it as, as a melody chorus, whether it be single or double melody. And those two strings are normally two in the same. The fretboard runs down the length of the mountain dulcimer. And we call it a fretboard because it's got these little metal, uh, they're made of different types of materials, but usually they're a metallic type of material. And they run along and they divide, they go crossways across the fretboard. And this is how we actually shorten the string to get different pitches. So if you look at the very, very top where we looked at the nut there, I'm going to skip past it because I want to kind of cover the fretboard here real quick. At the far other end of the fretboard, where the fretboard terminates, we've got the nut. That's one end of it. And at the very, very other end of it, we've got the bridge. And that's located down at the tail of the instrument. And this is where the strings connect, and this is where it's stationary. It may look like the one in the picture, or you might actually go down past the end of the tailpiece and connect down there. So the bridge is the little piece where the strings feed through at the tail of the instrument. And the nut is on the other end of the fretboard. And in between is the fretboard. So here's the deal. The strings connect at the tailpiece, and they go all the way they go through the bridge, across the fretboard, through the nut, and they connect to those tuners where we can tune them. And that's the movable part where the strings are attached. The area between the nut and the bridge is the area where the strings actually vibrate. They don't do much on the, on the connection side of the tailpiece. They don't do much where the tuners are. Where they actually vibrate and create sound are in between the nut 
and the bridge. So what happens is if you have a string and it's lengthened, the longer the string, the vibrating area of the string gets, the lower your note or the lower your pitch. It goes down in tone. If you shorten that string, then the pitch is going to go higher. So laying across the fretboard are all these little wires that are laid in there. They're called frets. And when you push your finger down upon the string to the left of each of these frets, what that does is it shortens the string by that much. So if you take a look at where the nut is, and I've got the word strings with the three little arrows, and then the next arrow down is part of the word frets. That first arrow is pointing at fret number one. If you were to push down there, then the string would only be vibrating from that fret down to the bridge, if that makes sense. So if I move down to the next fret, closer up, and then press down where that second fret arrow is, now I've shortened the string even more, which means that note's going to be pitched even higher. And I can keep doing that all the way up the fretboard until I'm getting way, way up there. And here's an example of what that sounds like. This is an open strum or open pluck. Now I put my finger down at the first fret. You hear how the tone went up. Next fret up. The tone continues. The pitch t continues to go higher. Every single time I go to another fret closer to the bridge, the note goes higher. It's pitched higher. So we are shortening the string every single time we move towards the bridge. But if I move in the other direction and start going back towards the nut, I'm lengthening the string. I'm making it longer. And those, string, or those uh, notes are going to start going lower in pitch. So that's what the frets are for. They are there for the purpose of making the string longer and shorter so we can play different pitches up and down the fretboard. The soundboard is the top piece of the mountain dulcimer. Some people just call it the top of the mountain dulcimer. Uh, and the soundboard uh, plays a really uh, big, important part. It actually vibrates. And that vibration is part of what creates the sound of the dulcimer. The same thing with the back. And there's no picture of the back here, but the back uh, vibrates as well. And you may have already discovered this, where if you've got the mountain dulcimer laying on your lap and you strum it, and then pick it up off your lap, you can tell that it actually gets a bit louder. I just picked mine off my lap there. The reason being is that when the dulcimer is on our lap, that back piece doesn't vibrate nearly as much. We're actually muting it a bit by having it on our lap. But thankfully, the soundboard, the top piece, vibrates as well. Try right now strumming and then take both of your hands and press them down on the soundboard after you strum. And do that a couple of times. You hear how the sound got a little quieter? That's because you've actually stopped the soundboard from vibrating. It seems like it's a pretty thick piece of wood, but it actually is vibrating and that is helping that sound come out. And mountain dulcimers acoustic instruments in general, are built to be big speakers, basically, to amplify the sound and help that sound travel out. So very important to that as well is next, the tone holes. Depending on the shape of your dulcimer, whether it's a teardrop or whether it's an hourglass shape or some other kind of a wacky shape, you're probably going to have at least two tone holes and this enables sound to escape and come out and be heard. Uh, normally with the teardrops you're only going to have a couple of them because there really isn't room for them close to the nut. With the hourglasses however you'll probably have an additional couple of sound holes up there as well. Do you need sound holes in order for the sound to be heard? No actually. In fact um, Trish Westman or sorry Tish Westman uh, out of West Virginia, her husband Greg made her a dulcimer and she was so excited to play it he hadn't cut the holes in the top yet and she picked it up and started playing it and went, Greg, this sounds fabulous. And so he, he just didn't put the sound holes in and it's the only dulcimer I've ever seen with no sound holes. It sounds killer. 
and and, they're, and they're, he's a fabulous luthier anyway. But so you don't need the tone holes, but they definitely help with the tone of the sound uh, of the sound, depending on how your dulcimer is built. Next below that we have the strum hollow, and the strum hollow uh, can be where you actually strum across the strings. Uh, as I'll show you here in a little bit, there's actually a, a better place to do that. But there are times when you want to be in that strum hollow because it's lowered a little bit. It's carved out so that you're not going across the fretboard uh, with your pick. But that's not a bad thing, as I'm about to show you. We talked about the bridge already, and we talked about the tailpiece of the instrument. So that's a basic anatomy right there of the dulcimer when you're, when you're talking with people about different parts of it so you can identify everything there. All right, let's talk about uh, strumming. And go ahead and get out your note beat durations. I'm getting ready to take this um, off the screen. But right now on the screen is what I want you to have nearby for reference. We're going to get into strumming right now. So I'm going to stop sharing. And real quick, I'm going to pop over and take a look at what in the world is going on with Logic Pro because it's, it's winking at me. You guys can hear me OK. That's good. Um, real quick, just to make sure, I'm going to go into audio. I'm going to uh, apply changes, select a driver. There's a driver issue there. Okay, not necessary. You guys can hear me. I've got signal. That's going to work fine. Coming on back to Zoom and going full screen. Okay. Looks like uh, looks like my top screen is frozen. So let me go ahead and take care of that real quick. Having the time of my life. Um, let me go ahead and kill. That's going to be uh, Yensid. All right. Let me put Yensid back in source, video source. It's going to be mobile app. Yensid camera 8. Connecting to stand up here and click. Oh, okay. I see what's going on now. Click allow. I've got a battery backup on this camera, and it is... Uh, it is cutting out on me and every time it does that then it creates an issue must remain vigilant about this stuff so let me do this one more time I'm going to add a new layer I'm going to remove this layer first all right now I'm going to put the mobile app over my shoulder so you guys can see what I'm doing on the mountain dulcimer I'm going to click that button that says allow again and now that should appear largely on the screen and now I'm going to add another layer for the inset. And that's going to be the C922. And now we've got picture. I'll come back over to Zoom, and everything should be cool. And I'm keeping my eye on you, Mr. Battery. When those lights go out, I'm jumping on it. OK. So uh, you've got those note beat durations in front of you. Let's talk about strumming. So if you've got your pick in front of you, go ahead and take that pick and hold it out in front of you in between your thumb and forefinger, just like that. And use a nice, light, relaxed grip. Don't squeeze it too hard. And I'm going to show you why. Nice and loose. Feel like you're almost going to drop it. You can barely feel it. Just really nice and loose. Now go ahead and feel the muscles in your arm, your outstretched arm, and feel how nice and relaxed and loose they are. That's exactly how you want to feel, and that's exactly how tightly you should hold your pick. Now, squeeze the pick with some force and feel the muscles in your arm. Feel all that tension. All of that is going to be in the way of you having a nice, smooth, consistent, and fluid strum because you've got too much stress going on there. So if you squeeze your pick, thank you, darling. If you squeeze your pick or if you use two fingers and a thumb on your pick, um, that could be very detrimental. Uh, what's going to happen if you use two fingers and a thumb is you're actually creating a fulcrum. And with any kind of pressure, you're bending that pick, which is increasing the uh, surface tension. And that's not a good thing. So you want to try as much as possible just to use two fingers, one on either side, and let that that pick flex. 
Okay, with a nice relaxed grip, what we're going to do is we're going to take that pick, make sure the point of it's going down, and we're not going to go in the strum hollow. We're actually going to go just right about where your lower tone holes are located. So if you find your strum hollow, come towards the, go away from the bridge a little bit. And we're going to focus right there. Get that point pointed down. What we're going to do is we're just going to strum outwards. And we're going to let that pick drag across all three strings just like this. Give that a shot. Now if you have a nice light grip on that pick, the pick's going to kind of kick backwards in your finger when it makes contact, but it's going to just lay itself across the strings. You don't have to do any wrist motion or anything. Just lightly go across the strings. And just go in one direction. And then bring your hand back and go outward again. Now you might have discovered already that you are primarily an inward strummer. And that's no problem at all. Just go in and move your hand back out and come back in again. Either way is fine. All right. Some of you might have issues with the pick feeling like it wants to jump out of your fingers. And so the natural tendency then tends to be to grab onto the pick a little bit harder. Try to avoid doing that because once again, the more you grab that pick, the more it's going to affect your strum down the road. It's a really bad habit to get into. You want to have a nice light touch on that pick. There are things that you can do with the pick. And um, I do actually, I've helped create a pick with V-Pix uh, and they call it the V-Pix Bing Ultra Light. And that's what I'm holding right now. It's as see-through as Wonder Woman's airplane, but it actually sticks to your fingers. It's made of cast acrylic, and so you don't have to worry about losing it. And you don't have to use adhesives or Gorilla Snot or any of that stuff. Yes, there's a product called Gorilla Snot to keep fingers attached to picks. Did you know this? Don't use the Gorilla Snot. It gets all over your strings, and it's so nasty. Um, but um, they're on my website. It's the V-Pick Bing Ultralight. And they stick to your fingers and they relieve the need to have to, you know, use Gorilla Snot or whatever else. So just kind of practice that a few times. Now I'm going to show you why we're playing in this area of the fretboard as opposed to the strum hollow. The closer you get to the bridge and the closer you get to the nut, there's more tension on the strings because they're actually rigid and they're locked in by the end. Uh, and the loosest portion of the strings is going to be towards the middle. So the sound becomes brittle as you get closer to the bridge. Watch as I strum from where we are now. I'm going to start moving towards the strum hollow. Listen to the quality of the tone of the instrument. how it got really brittle and nasal sounding as I moved towards the bridge, but it warmed up and got really sweet and rich as I got away from the strum hollow. We call that the sweet spot, right there where the lower tone holes are located. And even though you're playing above the fretboard, you know, guitars have the big sound hole and you don't usually see people hanging out there too much, or that's where people hang out. They don't really hang out over the frets nearly as much. With the Mountain Dulcimer, we're like all fretboard pretty much. It's okay to play across the frets if you use a light touch, you probably won't even touch the fretboard itself. But try that. Play from the sweet spot and then go strum through the strum hollow. Get all the way next to the bridge. And then come back across the strum hollow to the sweet spot. Makes a big difference, huh? You also may have noticed that it was a little bit more difficult to strum across as we got closer to the bridge once again because of the tension of the strings at that point. So it's a little easier to play in this sweet spot as well.